make sure that's going. There we go. All right. This is my contact information up here. My last name is pronounced Steimli if you're in the U.S. If you're actually from Germany, then you know that it's Steimla, but nobody says it that way. Well, at least not where I'm from. Uh, my website, joshsteimli.com. Email josh at mwi.com. And then all my social media profiles are Josh Steimli. So I'm on Twitter, Snapchat, WeChat, Instagram, everything that's blocked, basically. That's uh, Josh Steimli. You can find me there. So, uh, and as long as we're talking about Snapchat, I've got to uh, prove to my friends back home that I was actually here and that people actually care about uh, listening to anything I say. So, okay, I'm going to do a quick Snapchat video of everybody here. So, wave to uh, the MWI team back in the U.S. Here we are, class number two from Shenzhen. All right. There we go. How many Snapchat users do we have here? Anybody? I know it's blocked, but anybody? Does anybody use Snapchat here? Nobody is willing to admit it. Um, <laughs> all right. We, uh, I asked the same question in the first class. We had two who were uh, willing to admit it there. But so I'm excited to be here today. I have been living in Hong Kong for three years. I've come up here to Shenzhen maybe 10 times or so over the past three years. And to me, this is a really exciting place. Uh, it's, I've been into startups and entrepreneurship for the past 20 years or so. And there's nothing like the dynamic that's going on between Shenzhen and Hong Kong and Southeast Asia right now. And especially here in Shenzhen, it's really a focal point for Internet of Things, for hardware startups. Has anybody here been to the Hacks Accelerator that's here in Shenzhen? Has anybody been over there? I'd highly recommend if you get the time, take a tour of the Hacks Accelerator and go check that out. That is a place that is becoming famous worldwide. There are students from Berkeley and Stanford and top universities who are moving here to Shenzhen to do their startups, their hardware startups, their Internet of Things startups. And Hacks Accelerator is part one of the focal points of that. They have 100 companies in their accelerator there. And these people are doing exciting things. So now how many of you are from China? You're native to China. Can I see you raise your hands? OK, maybe a third of you. And the rest of you who are not from China, where are you from? Just Sampling. Anybody who wants to shout out, where are you from? U.S. US. Russia. Russia. Brazil. 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 Ah, que bon. From Morocco. Morocco. Another guy from Morocco. Yeah. So, uh, you guys know each other? Yeah. All right. <laughs> How many people live in Morocco? What's the population there? It's like, it's like 13 million. 13 million? Okay. So, it's, it's not like small enough that everybody knows each other, but that's small for a country, right? Um, yeah, I get people, I come over here and then people are like, oh, you're from the U.S., do you know so-and-so? And it's like, well, there are 300 million of us over there. It's not like I know everybody. But um, I'm on social media, but I'm not that social. So uh, for some of you who came to China from somewhere else, what were your reasons? Why did you come here? Why did you come to China? Why did you end up here in Shenzhen? What was your motivation? Anybody willing to... Answer that. Yep. Well, first was the culture. Second, the uh, business environment. Uh huh. Yeah, it's really attractive. I think you, know, you can do a lot of things. You have a lot of opportunities here. Mm -hmm. Shenzhen, like a Silicon Valley of China. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Silicon Valley of China. Somebody in the other class said the exact same thing. Silicon Valley of China. And it is kind of like that. Uh, anybody else? Other reasons why you came to China? Uh -huh. When you say culture, what do you mean exactly? Yeah, the, um, the way of life here is less regulated than San Francisco, for example. Uh -huh. It's totally different. Less regulated how? What do you mean? I mean, what are you trying to get away with?
Yeah. Interesting. Now, it's interesting that somebody would come from a Western country and move to China and say that they came to China because they felt too observed in a Western country and China they feel more free. I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, and yet, that is kind of what's going on here in China. I mean, despite uh, government oversight of the Internet and maybe it not being exactly the freest place, in a lot of ways it is a very free place in terms of doing business. It is kind of a land of opportunity. Um, I grew up in the United States, and so what I was taught in history school was that the United States is the land of opportunity and kind of always has been, even though the country is only 200 years old. And I was uh, brought up on kind of this entrepreneurial ethos or education and that everything was all about the U.S. And then I moved overseas, and I've lived overseas before, but I moved here to Hong Kong and Asia, and I feel like this is the epicenter of what's going on in the world right now. Silicon Valley is great. Everywhere is great. There's great stuff going on all over the world, but Asia is where things are really growing. And this is where the big companies of tomorrow are coming from. And you don't need to look any further than some of these apps that are coming out of China. I mean, WeChat has 600 million something active monthly users. 600 million people get on WeChat and use that app every single month. That's twice the size of the population of the United States. And in the U.S., people don't have no clue what WeChat is. They don't know about it. They've never heard about it. Uh, when Alibaba went public and it was this huge IPO, people were like, Ollie, what? Like, what is this company? They don't know anything about it there, and yet it's huge, and it's still just getting started. It's still just growing. Whereas everything in the U.S., it's kind of maxed out. It's kind of hit its limit in a lot of ways. I mean, there's lots of opportunity there, but a lot of these companies are having to expand overseas to grow, whereas things are just starting to grow here in Asia. And I was, uh, we just had lunch, and I was, we were talking, and I was just saying, Man, I'm so jealous of you guys. I wish I could come back to school. I wish I could be here learning again. I'm running a business now, and it keeps me busy. And every day, I go out and I talk with people from all around the world, and especially from here in Asia, and I think, man, I wish I could understand this language. I wish I knew more about what was going on here. I wish I could get more involved, but I'm busy running my business. And especially the language thing, I love learning languages, but it's just hard to find the time to do it. And you guys, you have this opportunity now where you have more time, you have more freedom. You might think you're busy right now as a student. I remember when I was a student and it felt like every professor thought that they were the only ones giving you homework or the only ones giving you assignments. <laughs> and you're like, you want to tell the professor, hey, I've got five other classes I'm going to. Like, you're not the only professor I have to deal with. So I'm getting laughs, so somebody feels this, right? So I mean, that's how I felt. It was like, I'm so busy as a student. And then you graduate, and then you leave university, and if you become an entrepreneur especially, you get so much more busy. And then you get married, and then you have kids, and you start putting all this stuff together, and you're like, oh, man, I wish I could go back to the university days. It was so easy. My time was so structured, and I had so much freedom to do all this stuff and learn things. and now I'm just working and slaving away all the time. Uh, so my advice, take advantage of what you've got right now as a student because you'll never have this freedom ever again. You'll never have this opportunity again. And right now you can make so many choices. Once you start a business, once you get a job, you start getting tied down with things. And I'll talk a little bit about this. I'm going to tell my story about how I became an entrepreneur and my background and how I ended up where I am today. And you'll see how choices you make determine the choices you can or can't make for years to come. There are choices I made back in 1999 that are still affecting my life today and have allowed me to make some decisions and have prevented me from making other decisions because of those choices. So um, now, again, I got some more questions for you guys because I want to know more about what you're interested in and what you're into. How many of you have seriously thought about maybe starting a business after you graduate from university or before you graduate? How many of you have thought about becoming an entrepreneur? Okay, we got a few hands. 
for those who are not, that's not even something that you've thought about, what do you want to go into? What do you want to do? What are you planning on doing after you graduate? There's kind of a pocket over here of people who didn't raise their hands for the entrepreneur question. So what do you, th what do you want to do? And don't worry, it's not, there's no right answer. I'm just curious what you're planning on doing after you graduate. Anybody? Don't make me call on you. Okay, green laptop. You, what are you going to do after you graduate? <laughs> PhD. PhD in what? Huh? In what? Uh, what do you want? Management. In management? Yeah, maybe. Okay. What would you do with the PhD in management? Huh? What would you do after <laughs> you get your PhD? Uh huh. So consulting, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. And your neighbor here. What do you want to do after you graduate? I want to work as a consultant. Uh huh. So also consulting. Yeah. Okay. Great. Consulting is a great field to go into. I mean, it's uh, the great thing about consulting, and really that's what I do. I'm a consultant too. I run my business, but it's we consult. We have lots of clients. We give them advice. We help them do things. The thing I love about being a consultant and working with lots of clients is I get to experience their businesses without actually having to be in their businesses. So my company, it's called MWI, and it's a digital marketing agency. I started it in 1999 when I was a student. So I was about your age. I was in your situation. And since then, we've worked with hundreds of clients. And I love it because I get to learn about all these different businesses. So I've learned about dairies and self-storage and e-commerce and manufacturing and law firms and just all these different types of businesses and I can look at them and say, oh, that's really interesting or eh, I don't want to do that. I'm glad they do, but I don't want to do it. So it's been really interesting to learn about a lot of these different businesses and see what types of things I'm interested in. Uh, my business, being an entrepreneur, this is the only job I've ever been able to keep more than five months in my life. Every other job I either got bored of or I got fired within five months. And I can't get fired here because I own it. So I've got that going for me. But also it's just been interesting. I've never gotten bored of running my own business. And a lot of that is to do with just working with all these different clients and always learning something new. So uh, I'm hoping today that by the end of our talk here that you'll have a little bit of insight into where entrepreneurs can come from. I'll tell you my story at least, and of course my story is my story. It's not everybody's story, but you'll have at least one idea of where entrepreneurs come from, what it's really like to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to give you the ugly side of it. And then hopefully there'll be some other lessons sprinkled in there about entrepreneurship and uh, what entrepreneurs contribute to the world and what it's like. So to go back to where it all started for me, I grew up in a home where I had quite a bit of, I would say, intellectual freedom to kind of do what I wanted. My mother was a school teacher, and my father was a rocket scientist. He worked for NASA, and he was actually an optical engineer. So he wasn't building rockets, but he's working on things that go on rockets. And he worked on the Hubble Space Telescope and other things like that. So he was a technologically minded guy. and. I grew up around technology. We had a computer in our home when I was five years old. I've got a photo of me when I'm five there playing with this computer. And so I got to see kind of the whole lifespan of personal computers. Uh, I'm kind of old. I'm 40 years old. I was born in 1975. And in 1975, computers were a different thing than they are today. I mean, this nothing like this existed. There were computers that filled entire buildings and they didn't have a fraction of the power that's in one of these today. Uh, the computer that I grew up on, or at least the, one, the first computer that we had, it was called a uh, TRS-80. It was made by a company called Radio Shack, which is now bankrupt and out of business. And uh, people affectionately called it the Trash 80. So it was the Trash 80 computer. And we would write programs on this computer, but you couldn't actually fit or run the whole program on the computer. It was too much to write the program and run it on the same computer or something. So we would 
save the computer or save the program off the computer to a cassette tape deck. You know a cassette tape? Do people remember cassette tapes? So we would save the computer program onto this magnetic tape on a cassette player and then you would push play on the cassette tape player and you would play the program to load it onto the computer. And then you could play like this really simple video game that was all squares and black and white and you could play like a really simple version of Space Invaders or Pong. Does anybody know Pong? I mean it's like, okay we got one person who knows Pong. So, um, so this was what I started out with computers. And then my dad got a new computer and it was ten times as fast and it had a larger hard drive and then he got another computer and another one to replace that. And I remember when he got a computer and he told me, I was a little kid but for some reason this stuck in my head. He said, this computer has a 20 megabyte hard drive. And he said, I have no idea how I am ever going to fill up this hard drive. What would I put on this hard drive? Do you know how much data 20 megabytes is? I'm a little kid, I'm saying, I have no idea, but I guess it's a lot. He said, I will never fill this up. A year later, it was full. So then he went out and he bought a second 20 megabyte hard drive. And he said, well, okay, I filled up the first one, but I'm never going to fill up the second one. There's just no way. And of course, a year later, that one was filled up. And you come fast forward to today where I have an external drive that's this tiny thing and it's got four terabytes on it. And it's not enough. I can't fit all my stuff on it. And you look at computing power today. What we have in our hands is just a miracle. The amount of power that goes into this tiny machine was just unimaginable a few years ago. I mean, ten years ago this didn't exist. Uh, you look back at 2005, I was looking at a graph the other day, 2005 mobile or smartphone sales, zero, because it didn't exist in 2005 and I was like, that's so weird that in 2005, which doesn't seem like that long ago to me, this did not exist. There was no such thing as this just 11 years ago and now we just take this for granted and it's the way things are. I like to imagine somebody from 20 years ago, if they could have just seen into the future what would they think about our society? They'd be like, how come everybody walks around holding this square thing and they've got this terrible posture and they're always going like this? Like, what's going on in this world? And we just take that for granted. It's just the normal thing. So, um, so I grew up around computers and in 1994, I left the country. I went to go live in Brazil for two years. I was a missionary for my church down there. And I was in the Amazon jungle. I was in the middle of nowhere. And so I just disconnected from technology for two years, pretty much. And when I came back in 1996, everything had changed. When I had left, my father was using Windows 3.1. And it was, it was terrible. And when, he came, when I came back, he was using Windows 95. Well, if you lived through that era, Windows 3.1 to Windows 95 was a huge difference. Windows 95 was incredible compared to Windows 3.1. Now, of course, you can't run Windows 95 on anything. And compared to anything today, it would be terrible. But the biggest thing that had changed was the Internet. When I left, my dad had a dial-up service. Who? Okay, no embarrassment here, but does anybody not know what dial-up is? I'm just curious. I wouldn't be surprised if some people are like, dial-up, what's dial-up? Everybody knows what dial-up is? Okay, let's do this the other way. Raise your hand if you know what dial-up is. Okay, that's better. That's a more accurate representation there. Okay, so dial-up, like you used to actually have to connect to the internet through a phone line and it dialed and you could hear your computer dialing numbers You'd listen to it and it'd go do -do 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 -do, and then it'd make a screeching sound like a fax machine and you would connect to the internet. And we had this thing called a modem. Well, we still call some of the things modems. But we had this modem and they had like a 28.8 .8 modem and that meant that you could download a one megabyte video in like two days or something. It was just terrible. And then we got 56K modems and 56K seemed so fast. It was just like screaming fast. 
And I remember in 1996 going online, I'm a skateboarder, so I grew up watching skate videos. I had my VHS and all my VHS tapes. And when they started putting skateboard videos online, I was like, oh, yes, I can just watch these videos that just came out. And I would go online, and there would be a video that was about that big on my screen. And I would start the video downloading before I went to bed so that when I woke up, I could watch the video. And the video was about 20 seconds long. And I had to go to bed to wait for it to download for 20 seconds of low resolution video that was like that big. That's how slow the internet was back then. And now it's like, I come here to Shenzhen, and of course I'm spoiled in Hong Kong. We've got this open 4G LTE, it's super fast. And I come to Shenzhen, and they've got 4G here too, but I'm like on it, I'm like, oh man, like, man, like I'm downloading this gigabyte file and it's going to take like an hour to download this thing. It's like, we get spoiled so quickly, right? So, um, so in 1996, I came back from Brazil and I saw all this progress happening with technology and I thought, up until then I had actually wanted to be an artist. I, was, I went to art school before I went to Brazil. I was into design and drawing and I thought I was going to be an illustrator. And I came back in 1996 and I realized that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to go into business. I wanted to do something in business. And I came back and I started studying business, but then I saw the internet coming out and I said, I've got to get into technology and I've got to stay on top of this because if I don't get on top of technology, I'm going to get left behind. I'll be outdated and nobody will hire me for anything. So at that time, the school I was going to had just come out with a program called Information Systems Management. It was this new thing. And I sat down with a professor and I said, you know, what should I do with my education? And he said, you should go into this information systems program. If you go into this program, you can go anywhere in the world. You can do whatever you want. It will give you all sorts of freedom. It's going to open all sorts of doors for you because people are going to need business people who understand technology. And I thought, that sounds great. That's what I want to do. And so I went into this technology program. And then I started trying to get some skills and I thought, well, what do I know how to do? I know how to design stuff. I understand design and what looks good. So I thought, I should start learning how to design websites. And I didn't know how to do it, so I went out and I got a book. And the book was so confusing and I just assumed that web design was confusing because this book was confusing. Now that I look back on it, it was just a terrible book that made it confusing. But at the time, I just thought, oh, this is so complicated and so complex. But I started playing around with websites and I would copy websites and then try to figure out how they worked. I'd copy down all the files and I'd go through it and I'd start tweaking things and see, okay, I changed this, it makes this change over here. And that's how I taught myself web design and building websites. And back then, building websites was a lot easier. Uh, but I taught myself some web design and so then in 1998, I got my first job doing web design for somebody. I was good enough that somebody wanted to pay me a little bit of money to design websites. And I started doing that, and I loved that. And then in 1999, I got a job with a dot-com. Now, it's hard for me to emphasize or to really communicate to you what was going on around 1999, but this is when all these internet companies were just getting started. 1996, there were a few internet companies out there, but if you went on the internet in 1996, there were maybe 500 websites or something, or maybe 1,000 or something, but there wasn't much out on the internet. It was kind of like this thing that a lot of people looked at and they'd say, oh, this is just a fad, it's going to pass, it's just this thing for people who are into it. People treated the internet like it was ham radio or some, like some niche hobby that people do, but nobody's serious. It certainly wasn't something looked on as like a business opportunity. But by 1999, everything had changed and people were saying, this is the future and these businesses that are online are going to be the biggest businesses in the world. This is when Amazon started and eBay and a lot of these huge, huge companies that are still around. And people were so excited about this but they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know where it was going. And so that's when the venture capitalists and the investors came in and they just started throwing money at anything that moved because they didn't know where it was going, but they knew they didn't want to get left behind. And so 
I got this job for this dot com and I'm working at this business. I'm employee number 22 or something, so it was a pretty small company. We're working on folding tables with big monitors, old computers, cables running everywhere. New people were being hired every day and just thrown into a room and they'd say, here's a computer, get to work. And we were just programming websites, building websites, doing all sorts of stuff. And the guys that I was working for had dropped out of university to run this business and they were having so much fun. They're flying around, they're meeting with investors and I was looking at this and I was like, man, these guys are having all the fun. And then I'm hearing stories about college students meeting with investors and telling investors, hey, I don't even have an idea yet, but I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm going to come up with something. Why don't you invest in me? And then they walk out with a check for five million dollars US. I mean, this stuff happened. Or people would just have an idea and they'd walk out with a bunch of money and they'd, it would literally just be an idea. There was nothing behind it. They had no management team. They had no experience, but they just had this idea and investors were just throwing money at these businesses. So here I am in this environment as a college student. I'm saying, wow, this is really exciting and I'm really getting excited about entrepreneurship and I'm looking at these guys that are about my age and just dropped out of school and I'm thinking, I need to start a business. I've got to get into this. I've got to start a business before I get left behind. And, but the thing was, I didn't know what to start. I didn't know what type of business I should do, but I knew how to design websites. So I thought, well, hey, I'll just start a web design business. I'll go into consulting. I'll go into providing a service for people. So in 1999, I quit my job at the company. It was then called mycomputer.com. And little side note, when I went to quit, or rather, they came to me and they said, we want you to quit school and work full time for us. I was just working part time while I was in school. And I said, no, I think I need to stay in school. And they said, well, if you want to stay here, you need to quit the job. But if you, or I mean, you need to quit school. But if you quit school, we're going to pay you more and we're going to give you these stock options. And they had just come out with the first round of stock options. So this was the best time to get stock at this company. And they said, we'll give you 3,000 shares of stock and then you can get more as you stay on. And I thought about this and I was like, no, I think I need to go back to school. I mean, I don't even know if this business is going to be around a year from now. Well, 10 years later, that business was sold to Adobe Software for $1.8 billion. And if I had stayed there and kept my stock options and grown with the company, then I could have paid off a couple of houses or something and made a million dollars. Um, but uh, it, it wasn't obvious back then when I left. So I left and I started my own business. And when I started my business, I had no clue what I was doing. But I thought the way the world works is you start a business and then people come and they buy stuff from you, right? And so I opened my business and nobody came and bought anything though. That was the problem. So I'm sitting there in my apartment with my computer. I'm ready to design websites, but nobody's calling me and nobody wants a website. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait, I, I thought this was different. Like everybody I see around me, they just start businesses and all of a sudden they've got money flowing in and all this exciting stuff's happening. And I'm sitting here and I'm ready for business and nobody's calling me. I just had no clue about sales or marketing or anything. I just knew how to design websites. So, I started calling people and I'd call everybody I knew and I'd email everybody I knew. I said, do you know anybody who needs a website? I can design websites. I'll do them really cheap. And the next week I'd call them back and I'd say, I'll do it even cheaper because I'm starving here and I'm having to sell everything I own on this other dot com eBay to make money to pay for food. So I was literally going broke going into poverty, trying to run this business that nobody was interested in because they didn't even know it existed. And the funny thing is the first client I got, now I don't know, does telemarketing exist here in China? Like do you get phone calls all the time from people trying to sell you stuff? Okay, so that's a thing here. So that's a thing in the US too. The first client I got came from a telemarketer who called me. And the guy called me and he tried to sell me something and I'm like, well, to be honest, I have like no money. I'm completely broke. He's like, well, what do you do? And I was like, well, I design websites, but I can't get any clients. And he's like, 
well, my brother needs a website. Let me introduce you to him. <laughs> so he introduced me to his brother, and that was my first client. And so I was like, wow, like telemarketing actually works, just not the way that I thought it worked. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so that was my first client. And then I got another client off to that, and then another client. And then things started kind of going well. And every time I'd get a new client, I'd up my price. So I'd raise my hourly rate. And here I am. I'm a college student, so I'm pretty desperate. So I started out really low, and then I raised it a little bit and raised it a little bit. And every time I'd raise my price, I'd get kind of scared. And I'd think, oh, man, I wonder if I can actually make this much money. And it wasn't that much. But at the time, it seemed like so much. And I'd raise it a little bit. And then uh, they'd always say, yeah, great. That sounds fine. And so I just kept raising that rate. And it doubled, and then it tripled, and then this one client came along and I had quadrupled my hourly rate and I was looking at this I'm like man I must be like the richest college student in the world I mean look how much I'm making here and again it wasn't that much but it seemed like a lot at the time and so then I got it in my head here now I'm finally doing great I started my business it was really tough for a few months then it starts going well then it starts going really well but I wasn't patient enough I thought, well, now that it's going this well, instead of just sitting back and enjoying the money I'm making, now I can start a real business. Not just me sitting at home. I can go get an office, and I can get employees, and I can grow this and turn this into a real business. So I did that. I went and I got an office, and I hired five people. And a month later, I realized, wow, people are really expensive to pay. Like, these people want to get paid money and stuff, and I've got this many clients and this many expenses, and this isn't working out quite the way I thought. I thought I was making a lot of money, but it wasn't a lot of money when I had five people that I had to pay. So after the first month I had my real business, I had to let three people go. And I felt terrible. I was like, sorry, I know I just hired you three weeks ago, but I can't pay you and you're fired. It's like, and I sat back and I was like, well, that didn't work out. Uh, where did I go wrong here? And I was just so naive about business. I didn't know what I was doing. I just I kept thinking that if I built it, they would come. I thought that if I had a business, people just showed up and they bought stuff. And it just didn't work that way. It seemed like it was working that way for everybody else, but it wasn't working that way for me. So, But just like the first time when I started the business just by myself, I survived, and it was me and one other guy, and then we got a few clients, and then things grew a little bit, and then we added people, and uh, I brought on a, some partners, and we survived, and we grew. And after about two and a half years, we actually had a good little agency. We had about 10 people working full time for us. We were doing good work. We were recognized. People knew who we were. We had a great name, uh, and everything was good. But once again, I wasn't satisfied, and I wanted something different. And so I had to go and ruin it all again. So um, I had a partner that I had brought on, and he and I didn't get along. He was a great guy. I was an idiot. And we just clashed on a bunch of things. And so I'm sitting there thinking, I want to run the business this way, and he wants to run it this way, and I'm sick and tired of this. And how do I get out of this arrangement with him in a way that is good and honest, but how do I free myself to go do things the way that I want to do them? And, at, and so then another company came along and they offered to buy us out. Now, if I could go back in time, I would slap myself around and I would say, don't do this deal, don't do this deal. And the funny thing was, I had a mentor. If you can get a mentor when you're starting a business or anything else you do, anything in your career, always look for mentors, somebody who's been there, done it, is older, wiser, knows what they're doing, and can tell you what to do and what not to do. There's no reason for you to go through all the pain of learning these lessons by yourself. I had a mentor. but And he came in and he said, don't do this deal. This is a bad deal. He explained to me why it was a bad deal, all these red flags. And I thought, those sound like really good reasons for not doing this deal. But I'm going to do it anyway. And I pushed forward with this deal because, one, I wanted out of this partnership. And I just thought, this deal gets me out of this partnership. And two, I bought into a lot of the hype that these people who were buying us out sold us. They, told, they were listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. They had 200 employees. The company was worth a ton of money. 
They were acquiring all sorts of other businesses, and I just thought, yeah, we're going to sell our company here, and I'm going to be rich, and then I can go off, and I can also start my business and run it the way that I want to run it. So we did this deal with this company, and it wasn't a cash deal. It was a stock deal, and that means that I got a piece of paper that said that I owned 800,000 yeah, 800, shares of stock in this company, and if I could have sold those shares that day, it would have been, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, or something like that, that day. However, there was a restriction. I couldn't sell the stock for one year. But I thought, hey, I'm as good as rich. I mean, what's going to happen in one year? Well, a year later, the company that bought my company was broke, basically out of business, delisted from the NASDAQ, completely worthless. And so that piece of paper I had was worth nothing. I had no money. In addition, when that company bought us out, they took all our computers, furniture, equipment, everything, all the assets that we had, they took those things. But those things were leased, and I was still supposed to pay the leases on that. Well, when they went bankrupt, they said, well, we're not going to pay these leases anymore. Who did those leasing companies come after? Not that company. They came after me. And I had to pay off all this equipment and furniture out of my pocket because this company couldn't make the lease payments and I hadn't structured the agreement the right way to make sure that this company took over those leases. So not only did I end up giving my company away for free, but it cost me about $40,000 US to give my company away. So I lost my business and I lost another $40,000 on top of that. And that's the environment I went into when I started my second business. So I felt pretty miserable going into the new business. But I thought, wow, at least I'm free. At least I can do things my way now. And my way is awesome, and it's going to be great, and I'm free of my partners. And now I've learned all these valuable lessons from having made all these mistakes. And this next business is going to be great because I know exactly what to do. So I started the next business, same business, doing web design, marketing type stuff. And this time, I couldn't blame anybody else. I couldn't say, oh, it's my partner's fault or it's somebody else's fault. It was all on me this time. And I started that business, and it just utterly failed. It didn't fail bad enough, though, that we went out of business. It just failed bad enough that I didn't make any money and it wasn't going anywhere. But it succeeded well enough that it kept me going. It was like the worst possible way to be in business. I mean, if you're going to be in business, you want to be making money. You don't want to be losing money. You don't want to go out of business. But you'd rather go out of business than kind of stay in business but not really be in business. And that's where I was in. The business was doing well enough that every day I would come into the business and I'd say, oh, we're so close to this deal. We're so close to achieving XYZ objective that that would keep me going, but then it wouldn't happen. And so then a month later, I'd be like, oh, man, if I'd known that wouldn't go through, I just would have quit. But now I've got this other deal on the table, and if this goes through, then it's going to be huge for the business. I went on that way for four years thinking, oh, we're just about to become successful, and that just kept me going. And for those four years, I didn't get paid at all. I didn't pay myself a single time during those four years. I couldn't. There was no extra money to pay me. I had employees, I was paying the employees, often quite late, but I could never pay myself. So for four years, we lived off, we lived off of my wife's income, and I worked 100-hour weeks. I slept at the office. I would sleep on the furniture. I slept on the floor. Uh, I was in front of my computer all the time. I ate junk food, fast food, McDonald's stuff all the time because I would just go get a meal, and I'd sit in front of the computer and eat and type away and I got really out of shape and unhealthy. If I walked, I mean I walked up these stairs today here, I couldn't have made it up these stairs in this building back then. I would have been wheezing by the time I got to the top of the stairs. I was just in terrible shape. The business was in terrible shape. And this went on for four years. And I used to go in our conference room at night sometimes because I was spending nights there in the business. And I'd go in there at night sometime and sit in the dark with the lights off. 
and I would just be all depressed and I'd sit there and just think, what am I doing wrong? Why am I failing? Why is everybody else around me successful and I'm just failing miserably here over and over and over again? What am I doing wrong? And at the end of 2006, I decided I've had enough. I'm going to quit, but I need a way out. I need something else to do. I need s something bigger to go on to, bigger and better. So I thought, I'm going to apply to Harvard's MBA program. I mean, they would love to have a struggling entrepreneur who's really been in the trenches, right? Wouldn't that be a valuable thing for Harvard to have? So I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, here I am. I've been failing for years. I have nothing to show that's admirable about my work experience. And yet somehow I thought that that would be a positive for Harvard. So I applied to Harvard and I promptly got a rejection letter. And I sat there reading that rejection letter and that was, that was rock bottom for me. That was the moment where I was like, it, the, life cannot get any worse. I'm depressed, I'm fat, my business is failing, Harvard hates me. And <laughs> I'm just thinking, what, how can this get any worse? Um, Thankfully, through all of this, my wife stuck with me. I mean, my wife, if, I don't know why she stuck with me, but she was very patient and she just kind of went along with all this. Now, in retrospect, she's like, I should have put my foot down and told you, like, this cannot go on, right? And I'm like, yeah, you should have done that. Yeah, that would have been good. But uh, she was very patient and she was very supportive of what I was doing and my entrepreneurial ambitions. But at this point, I just, I thought, I can't go on doing this. I can't live this way anymore. I'm going to die, literally, if I keep living this way. It's got to change. But I didn't know what to change. I just couldn't figure out what else I could do. I felt like I had tried everything. Nothing worked. Everything failed. And one night, I was sitting with our um, guy, administrative assistant. He was at, ran the front desk. And he was a friend of mine. And we were sitting talking and I was going through all this and saying, Mark, I don't understand. I mean, I, I know everything I've done wrong. Everything I've done has been wrong. But why can't I do anything right? And what do I need to change? I don't know what to change. I've tried everything and nothing works. And yet, here are all these other businesses doing the same thing and they're successful. And he had just gone to this self-help course that sounded really crazy, but he said, Josh, you need to go to this course. It'll open your eyes. It'll show you some of the stuff you're doing wrong. And I was like, I got nothing to lose. This sounds completely ridiculous, but sure, I'll go do this self-help course. So I went to the self-help course, and it was crazy, and it was a little silly, but it did open my eyes to some of the things I was doing wrong with the business. And one of the things I realized was I had really invested my ego into this business. This business was me. It represented who I was as a person. And I couldn't let anybody see the business as a failure because that would mean that I was a failure. And that would be embarrassing. That would be shameful. And, I, and so everything I was doing was designed to make the business look successful, whether or not it was actually successful. And once I realized this, I thought, well, that's pretty stupid. I mean, to go broke and not get paid for four years just to look successful, like, what's the point of that? And so I started looking at how I was running the business, and I thought, why do I have this office? I have this really expensive office space. Do I need this office? No. Our clients never come here. Our employees can work from home. There's this internet thing that connects everybody. We don't need to be in this office sitting next to each other. So why am I spending all this money on this office space? Let's get rid of that. And we did. And then I looked at the employees. I said, I've got 10 employees that are full time. Do I need all these employees? Now, I don't like to let people go, but I'm going broke here. I'm losing money and the employees aren't even getting paid on time. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, do I need all these people or do I just like having 10 employees and I like being able to tell people that I've got 10 employees? And I thought, yeah, my ego's really wrapped up in this. So we let some people go and we put other people on contract. And I started working out of my home. And it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing for people to see that I didn't have this successful business. Sometimes people would call up my business and they'd try to sell us stuff. And it was obvious that they thought we were a lot bigger than we really were. But that was flattering to me when they'd say, oh, you're this big company and you can buy all this stuff. And I'd say, well, no, we're not going to buy all that because actually we're broke. But 
it was flattering to me that people thought that we were as big as it appeared that we were. So my ego really took a hit, but I recognized that it was silly to make bad business decisions just to support my ego. And so we started scaling back the business and downsizing. So I went from going ten or twenty thousand dollars into debt every single month. I had racked up about a half a million dollars in debt and we went to paying off ten or twenty thousand dollars in debt every month. Within two months we made this switch. So I went from this place where I was saying, I have no idea what to do, I've tried everything, nothing works, everything fails, I don't know how to fix this, to wow, now we're generating $20,000 of leftover money every month that we can use to pay down debt. That all happened in two months and all I had to give up was my ego, which didn't cost me anything. So it was great. Um, so then the business started doing better, but I thought, man, I made so many mistakes now and I've been so blind to so many things. I don't want to go back into that for a while. So I just worked out of my house for a few years and I had some contractors so I'd get business in, I'd outsource it to these other people and I kind of managed these connections with people. And after a few years I thought, you know, I think I know for sure this time most of the stuff I did wrong. I think I have some ideas about how to do this right this time. And I'm ready to try again to grow this business and turn it into a real business again. And one of the things I recognized was I didn't know how to sell. Now you go back to when I quit working for that dot com and I started doing websites in my apartment and I just thought, oh, I'll build websites and people will come and they'll just buy stuff. I had no clue about sales and marketing. And I still didn't have much of a clue about sales and marketing, except that I recognized that I needed to hire somebody who could actually sell the stuff that we did and that was going to be a key. And I recognized that I needed some sort of marketing tool to bring business in to tell people what we did. So in 2012, well 2012, all of 2012 I spent looking for a partner. And at the end of 2012 I found the guy that would become my partner. His name is Corey Blake. And Corey came on as a consultant first, helping me out with sales. And he was just giving me advice. Then he started working for me part time. Then he came on full time. And then I said, Corey, you're the guy I've been looking for. You're the guy I need here. I want you to be my partner. And so we split the business 50-50 and he has half, I have half. And Corey's strength was sales, closing deals. Around the same time, something lucky happened. I received a blessing which was that I had a friend who wrote for Forbes magazine. And I was sitting with her one day and saying, hey, how did you get this gig writing for Forbes? Like that's that's a pretty big deal. How did you do that? I had been blogging for about 10 years. So I had my own blog. I'd written 900 posts. Nobody really cared to read the stuff that I was writing, but I enjoyed writing. And so I'd been blogging and I thought, man, I'm blogging on my own blog that nobody reads. She's blogging on Forbes and she's got tens of thousands of people re reading, it, writing, reading everything that she's writing. So I asked her, I said, how did you get this? And she said, oh, yeah, so Forbes has this business model where they have all these unpaid contributors, people who write for free for Forbes because they, they get to write for Forbes and they get to put that on their resume and then they get the publicity of writing for Forbes. And I said, wow, that sounds pretty good. And she's like, yeah, if you want, I'll introduce you to my editor and who knows, maybe he'd be interested in having you write for Forbes. And in my mind, I thought, I'm too busy for this. I don't have time to write for Forbes. I mean, I'm running this business. I'm too busy. And thank goodness I didn't say, eh, never mind, I'm too busy. That's interesting, but no thanks. I said, yeah, sure, whatever. Well, two weeks later, she introduced me to the editor and he says, hey, I've read some of the stuff on your blog. We'd love to have you write for Forbes. And I said, well, okay, that's kind of flattering. My ego could use a boost these days. So um, I said, great. So I started writing for Forbes. And when I first started writing, I just thought, oh, this is fun. I get to write for Forbes. And I was writing about startups and entrepreneurship and people would read it. And I thought, and I'd get compliments from people, and I thought, oh, this is a lot of fun. And then one day I thought, I'm going to write an article about what my business does. I'm going to write an article about search engine optimization, which is kind of our core service. 
And I wrote this article on how to hire an SEO firm. So how to hire our type of business. And I went through all the things that clients have to deal with hiring an SEO firm and the mistakes they make and how they can avoid those mistakes when they're hiring an SEO firm. And I published this article and then something funny happened. This article went to the top of Google whenever somebody typed in how to hire an SEO firm. And guess who types in how to hire an SEO firm? People who are hiring SEO firms or are looking for an SEO firm. So all of a sudden, these people would type that in, they'd see the Forbes article, they would read the article, and then they'd say, well, I'm looking to hire an SEO firm. This guy who wrote this article sounds like he knows what he's talking about. He has an SEO firm. I should go hire this guy. And all of a sudden, we just started getting tons of emails and phone calls from this one article that I wrote on Forbes. So I'm sitting here, and we're getting all these emails coming in. And I just hired on Corey, who's really good at closing deals. So we're just funneling these leads to Corey, and he's just closing these deals left and right. And all of a sudden, our business, my business, that's now our business, that has never done that well in the past, all of a sudden is just skyrocketing and growing like crazy, and we're having trouble keeping up with it. For the first time in, let's say I started in 1999, this is all happening in 2013, so 13, 14 years of running this business, feeling like a failure, and all of a sudden, something's working. Something is working the way that it should be working. So we start getting tons of clients coming in, and now we're hiring people, but it's not like we were hiring people before. Before, when I'd hire people, I'd say, well, big businesses have a CFO, so I need a CFO. So I'd go hire a CFO. And then I'd realize, I don't even know what a CFO does, and I've got this CFO, and I don't know what he's doing, but I don't think he's doing anything because I don't think there's any work for him to do. I just thought we needed a CFO, so I hired a CFO. But startups don't need a CFO. So I had, uh, that's how I made hiring decisions before. Well, now instead it was, wow, we've, we just got five new SEO clients, and our only SEO guy is too busy. We need to go hire a new SEO guy. So we'd go hire a new SEO guy. See the difference there? Hiring because you think you need somebody versus hiring because you absolutely need that person and you can't survive without that person. So that was the difference there in hiring between the old way and the new way. So the business started growing and there's still a lot of challenges. There's still lots of times when we've made mistakes even after all that. But we started getting more and more pieces of this puzzle right and the business grew. So where we are today, we have 15 full-time employees. We have about 30 part-time contractors that do work for us. And the growth path that we're on a year from now, we might be double or triple the size we are today. So we might have 30, 45 full-time employees. I've never had, during all those 14 years before, we never got over 10 employees. And when we had 10 employees, I couldn't pay them all. Now we've got 15 and our issue is just how do we bring people in faster and how do we get all this work done that we've already got coming in and our people are just maxed out and they're as busy as they can possibly be. So it feels a little bit like an overnight success that just took 15 years to get going. Uh, but now things are finally working out for us when it comes to entrepreneurship and we're having a good time most of the time. So uh, now what I'd like to do is that's my story. And I guess to expand a little bit more on some of the other things that I do, uh, this uh, Forbes opportunity has really been amazing. So I started writing for Forbes. And again, I just loved writing. It was fun for me. And then it turned out that I could make money off of it, even though they weren't paying me, but I could make money by talking about what I do for my business. And I expanded that because I thought, well, if I lose this Forbes thing, I'm dead. So I've got to get other things or write in other places. And so I went out and I started writing for other publications. I would pitch myself as a writer to other publications. And so over the past three years, I've written over 200 articles for not only Forbes, but Entrepreneur Magazine, Mashable, TechCrunch, Time Magazine, South China Morning Post, and about 10 other publications. And so now I've got my risk is diversified across all these platforms. And the funny thing is, is actually Forbes let me go about two months ago. So now I'm like, 
oh, okay, I'm glad I have all these other platforms and I don't have to depend on Forbes. So, uh, and writing for Forbes has opened all sorts of deals. I got a book deal out of it. I got my first book coming out uh, from a real publisher in about a month. Uh, it's allowed me to get into all sorts of organizations and talk to amazing people. It's great. When you have the Forbes name, you can call up anybody and say, hey, I write for Forbes. I'd love to interview you. And you can get into just about anybody that way. And so I've been able to interview all these people that I look up to and idolize because of that Forbes brand. So it's just opened up all sorts of amazing doors that way. So if you know how to write, don't underestimate the power of just simple writing. I never saw myself as a writer. I just kind of enjoyed blogging stuff. And yet that turned into the biggest opportunity that ever happened in my business because I just happened to enjoy writing. So there's a lot of power there in being able to create content like that. Um, but I'd like to open it up for questions now. Some of you might be interested in starting businesses. Maybe you're not interested in starting businesses, but there are other things that I've talked about that you might have questions about. So uh, we have more or less as much time as you want uh, to ask questions, so we'll open it up to you. Who goes first? Yes. Sure. So, well, the main thing was what I said with that Forbes writing. Now, the issue there is not everybody can write for Forbes, right? So what do you do if you're not writing for Forbes? How can you achieve the same thing? And there are lots of ways to get content out there. So this is called content marketing, and this is what we do in as, as an agency, too, is we do content marketing for our clients. But you can create your own content, and you can get that out there in a number of ways. For example, right now, I'm speaking to this class, and I've got that video camera running over there. When this class is over, I'm going to take that video. I don't have to do any fancy editing or anything. I can just take that video and stick it up on YouTube. And I label that as what it is. Here I am talking about entrepreneurship, and I can say maybe I'm talking about a little bit of digital marketing or something. That video is going to go on YouTube, and it's not going to get tens of thousands of views. It might only get a few hundred views, but it might be exactly the few hundred views that I need and somebody might come across that video and see me talking here and say, oh, we should go hire this guy. He sounds like he knows what he's talking about or something. So is there anything preventing you from doing that about your business? I mean, you can point a camera at yourself, your phone, and videotape yourself, put it up on YouTube, and you might be surprised what comes from just that simple action. Because everybody's frightened by video. People are scared of it. They don't know what to do. They're afraid they're going to do something wrong. But you videotape yourself, stick it up on YouTube, and I mean, they're just crazy simple videos that get tens of thousands of views. For example, I got an iPhone the other day to record a video on. And I'm trying to figure out how to hook this mic up to my iPhone. And I've got the cable that attaches to it on the other end, and it's not working. So I'm out there online. I'm trying to figure out, find all these different tutorials about how to, I mean, how do I connect this mic to an iPhone? Isn't it just supposed to work? Isn't that the whole thing behind Apple? It just works, and yet I can't figure out how to get this to work. And so after hours of research, I finally stumbled onto a video, and this guy says, oh, by the way, if you don't have this adapter in between the cables, it's not going to work. So I'm like, thank you. I've got this cheap little cable I just need to go buy and then it will all work. Well, that video, it's just some guy in his home office. He made this simple video about how to connect a mic to an iPhone. And it's got 35,000 views on that video. And that's what he does for a business. He does audio video type stuff for a business. So I'm thinking, he's got 35,000 views of this simple video he put together, nothing fancy. And I bet he's gotten a bunch of business out of that video that he put up. And that video is going to keep producing leads for his business for years to come because it's, it's out there forever. 
So I mean, that's just one simple example of how anybody can produce simple content and it can turn into leads. But you can also write and publish on the LinkedIn Pulse Network. You can put out content on your own blog. You can publish on Medium. Um, social networks like Twitter, Facebook, all this stuff, yeah, you c can sometimes get business through that, but I find things like LinkedIn to be a lot more effective generally. It depends what you're selling. But the point is you want to create content that helps people, that answers questions that your customers have. Whatever it is you're selling, your customers have questions. And if you can answer those questions, whether it's written, audio, video, however you answer that question, if you answer that question, you stick it out there, people will find it and you'll get business from it. There's a great book all about this called Utility. It's spelled Y-O-U, Utility by Jay Bear. You go read that book, it's all about doing this and it's really straightforward stuff. But that's the easy way to sell and market yourself because when we create contents, we're also doing our own blogs in addition to the Forbes writing and everything. We do our own blogs that we control. We do email newsletters. We do all sorts of marketing. The great thing about content marketing is that when somebody reads that content, they become convinced that you're the expert and that you're the person they want to hire. So by the time they call you, they already want to hire you. And so when we bring salespeople in, we say, look, we're not hiring you to go out and sell. We're hiring you to answer the phone. When somebody calls that phone, they already want to hire us. You just have to close the deal. It makes it so much easier to close those deals when they've already been sold by the content. Rather than you going out and going to events and trying to get people to listen to you and people are trying to avoid you because they don't want to talk to a salesman, we never do that. We never go out and sell. People call us because of the content that we put out there. Yeah, but it's not, but it's not like an advertisement. It's not like we're putting out an ad and saying, hey, we're the best because of this, this, this. We're saying, you have this question. We're going to answer this question very authentically, openly, transparently. We're going to tell you all the secrets about it. And when we're really open and authentic in answering that question, and sometimes we might even make ourselves not look like the best option, but we say, hey, here's the honest truth about the answer to this question. When people sense that we're being open and honest about it, then they trust us. And people do business with people they trust and like. And so if we have the right tone and they like us and then they trust us because we're honest and authentic, they'll want to do business with us even if they know there's a better option out there. They'll still say, you know, I know this company's better than you are, but I like you guys and I trust you guys and that's worth something and they'll still come hire us. All right. Yes. Um, please and uh, thank you for your lecture and that's a miserable but interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have two questions. And the first is, uh, you mentioned that you, your ambition in the, during the work period and it's, uh, do you have any change about your ambition at that time and now? And the second question is, um, many um, professors or um, some people may say that you gra fresh graduate that you have no experience and you um, you don't know what's happening outside in our society. And um, so in your opinion, um, uh, or what's your suggestion for those who want to uh, start, a, start a business? Or do you think it's a good way based on your experience? Okay. So the first question was, how has my vision changed from the old way to the new way? And then the second question is, should you go out and get work experience before you start a business, or should you just dive in now as a student, right? Yeah. Okay. So the first question, I guess, what do you mean by vision when you say, when you ask how has my vision changed, what exactly? Can you just say um, your, your wife is um, supporting you and uh, 